Thousands took to the streets once again over the past week in various parts of Pakistan to protest the growing economic crisis, particularly the cost of energy. How is one of the most populous countries in the world coping with a situation to which there seems no end in sight? In a new report, the Physicians for Human Rights Network has shown the clear correlation between the Israeli occupation and the mental and physical health of the women of the Gaza Strip. The question, is anybody listening? And a group of Australian lawmakers will visit the United States to lobby for an end to the political persecution of WikiLeaks founder and publisher Julian Assange. Will they manage to break the code of silence around the Assange case in the US establishment? Salams, you're watching Daily Debrief coming to you from the People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani. In the latest round of public protests and the continued inability of the government in Pakistan to deal with the ongoing economic and political turmoil in the country, thousands took to the streets against the rising costs of electricity and petrol. The cost of electricity, for example, has doubled over just the past three months in Pakistan. And petrol has crossed the 300 rupee mark uh, to the litre. In several parts, including the country's financial hub of Karachi, protests turned violent. Last year's massive flooding across Pakistan, the power vacuum following the no-confidence motion against Prime Minister Imran Khan, and an inflation rate that has topped a record 36% have all resulted in anger and frustration for the people of Pakistan. We go over to uh, Prashant now for an update on the situation from the ground. Uh, Prashant, good to have you on Daily Debrief. Uh, let's start with the latest uh, that you're hearing uh, from reports on the ground. Uh, what is the situation? We've, of course, seen a week uh, of protests against uh, increasing price rise that's continuing unabated in Pakistan. That's it. So I think it would not be wrong to say that Pakistan is going through a you know, crisis of many dimensions, actually. And we talked about this in earlier episodes. On the one hand, we have a a political crisis that has stretched on for more than a year, almost a year and a half right now. And this has been compounded and, you know, it has sort of worked very closely in some senses with an economic crisis that, you know, has continued to devastate the ordinary people of Pakistan in terms of their livelihoods, in terms of their, you know, expenditures. And every aspect of their life has been hit. Of course, there is there are also security issues. And all of this has also been sort of compounded by the kind of repression that the Pakistani government, earlier, of course, the uh, Shabash Shari government and now the caretaker government as well, that the various governments and uh, bureaucracies are enforcing on the repression people are, and unleashing on people, the people who are protesting, critics, etc. So in every aspect of life, there's clearly a crisis. But right now, what is really on top of people's minds is the increasing power bills. And the impact has been quite drastic. Like you said, last week saw a number of protests. There was a shutdown on Saturday. People in many parts of the country complaining that you know, they're not even able to earn enough to uh, afford electricity bills. And, you know, people looking at drastically changing their lifestyles. Traders, for instance, looking at completely, you know, reducing the number of hours they are trying to stay open. And I think the important thing to note here is that two or three things, and two or three important things. One is that a, a large part of this is because of the IMF. Now, the IMF, as part of giving a loan to Pakistan, has insisted that, uh, you know, people pay the government charge for electricity rates at the actual prices remove subsidies to whatever extent possible. That has actually contributed. And this has been a condition for the IMF to give the loan uh, of $3 billion to the uh, Pakistani government. And the Shahbaz Sharif government, before it left, uh, you know, uh, accepted these conditions and now the caretaker government has implemented it. So that's one big factor. The other factor, of course, is that it is also a product of the privatization of the power sector, which took place in the 90s. We'll soon have, a, have an interview with Taimur Rahman of the Mazdoor Kisan Party where he explains this. But one interesting thing he says is that today the crisis that exists is because that the, the what is called the independent power producers who took over the electricity sector in the 90s as a result of this privatization basically you know are getting huge amounts of money from the government and yeah that has actually contributed to this as well. So uh, definitely what we're seeing is that the common people are the, you know the capitalists is always uh, benefiting the richer sections benefiting whereas the poorer people really struggling and suffering. Uh, through this massive increase. And of course, uh, there's not just electricity prices that are increasing. Overall, inflation is quite high as well. 
we are talking especially food inflation is also pretty yeah. high so all of this combined together is really hitting the pockets and the wallets of the people of pakistan who are looking at having to make some drastic changes and this is led to uh, you know this like you said like you said this outrage this anger in fact i believe that one of the an employee of a private company was also assaulted by angry people so we have a situation where uh, like i said there there is a government which is a caretaker government and mm-hmm. has no real authority and on the other hand the living conditions have become so difficult that people are out on the streets so a very difficult times ahead especially in the coming months for the people of pakistan uh, prashant we saw reports uh, coming in over the weekend of a meeting uh, between the chief of the pakistani armed army uh, and a group of uh, those very same capitalists that you were mentioning who were perhaps uh, managed better than most to weather the conditions uh it, that we've seen in pakistan of course we also have b- before this the pandemic the floods that hit the country in a massive way uh, and climate change that's not going anywhere uh in all of that there was some mention uh, though of perhaps moving away from this imf uh, kind of led uh, way of you know going deeper into a debt cycle do you see there being any realistic political will to sort of make that kind of a hard shift actually to be honest no really because uh, you know in the sense that we need to sort of look at what the political situation in pakistan right now uh, like we said we've talked about this before on the one hand we have imran khan still in jail who is arguably probably one of the most powerful forces in pakistani politics despite being in jail we have the older establishment parties which were in power until recently they are now is a caretaker government because as per the rules the election has to be managed by a caretaker government and uh, you know but there's still a lot of <clears throat> uncertainty regarding when the elections might happen because there is this whole argument of having to do a delimitation process redraw the borders of constituencies mm-hmm. and now there's a lot of confusion will it be completed in november will it be completed in december are we looking at elections in february the original elections were supposed to be held in november so you know we are looking at say something uh, say uh, probably say let's say february elections and until then there's definitely going to be no uh chance that uh, any government can do anything of that sort and uh, from now on from now to february we are going to see massive attempts by the pakistani establishment on one hand to make sure that imran khan somehow doesn't contest uh, both the legal measures and by the kind of assaults on his political machine uh, you know the arrest of leaders of his party etc etc imran khan is definitely going to try to resist it uh, but of course <clears throat> it's very difficult to say you know who will come out on top in february mm-hmm. and even when the elections are held in february and you're going to have a need, suppose uh, some uh, somebody gets a decisive enough mandate to form the government there's a pest with the pakistani military which you know is really the power behind uh, the throne has always been so in pakistan so keeping all this in hand of course the imf uh, it's not the imf has given a loan and gone away this is this yeah. uh, you know like we talked about for so many countries these are cycles of loans you take a loan this a couple of years later you're back to have a, having to take a new loan to often meet some of the conditions from the earlier loan as well right so uh, you know even if a, a new government comes to power every government has come to power saying we'll do something different but has ended up following the imf path so part of it is a global problem which remains unaddressed the question of debt mm-hmm. itself part of it is specifically unique to pakistan which is that in the kind of political crisis that exists right now uh and the lack of certainty regarding who will form a government and under what conditions it is yeah. very difficult and also the fact of course that none of the contenders have really come up with any see the maybe you know uh, any serious uh, none of the relevant contenders or the strong contenders have come up with any serious proposals to actually get out of this cycle as well so keeping all this in mind you know it's uh, very difficult to see an end uh, to this uh, cycle right now All right, we'll leave it there uh, for today. Thanks very much for that update on what's going on in Pakistan, and we'll of course continue following uh, updates uh, or developments there uh, on Daily Debrief. And next up, together with the Gaza Community Mental Health Program, the Physicians for Human Rights Network has released a new report examining the consequences of Israeli human rights violation in the occupied territory on the physical and mental health of over 400 women who participated in the two-year-long collaborative project. as a result of israel's military occupation blockade and ongoing aggression the report says and i quote women experience persistent intergenerational and long term mental and physical outcomes that manifest throughout their lives they felt threatened were injured by israeli military lost family members and faced varied restrictions due to israel's blockade we cut across now to anna vrachar of the people's health dispatch who draws a clear link 
between the exposure to human rights violations and psychological distress. Anna, as always, it's good to have you with us on uh, Daily Debrief. First up, if you could share with us some of your key findings uh, from your reading, of course, of this latest report and an ongoing and critical issue. So uh, the study we're discussing uh, is actually uh, a joint project between Physicians for Human Rights Israel and the Gaza Community Health Project uh, Program. Uh, essentially, it focuses on Palestinian women living in the Gaza Strip uh, and explores the interactions between uh, the human rights violations between the of the Israeli occupying forces uh, with the mental and physical health of Palestinian women. Uh, the uh, the research included over 400 Palestinian women living in Gaza, uh, and of course they have all been exposed uh, to human rights violations over the course of time uh, due to the Isra Israeli military occupation to the blockade. Uh, so essentially they have been exposed to uh, human rights violations due to the military occupation, to the blockade, and to the ongoing military aggression in the region. So when we look at the results of the study, uh, what we see is that it highlights the link between human rights uh, violations and mental health. So uh, essentially what it shows is that uh, the human rights that Palestinians are exposed to every day uh, are having a measurable impact on their mental health uh, and of course on their physical health and on, on the overall well-being of Palestinians. So, um, the consequences of uh, the violations of human rights, of course, they differ. Uh, but one of the crucial things that this report highlights is that it's essentially not about individuals. Uh, it's about communities. It's about families. Uh, it's even about generations of people who are now suffering uh, from, uh, from se severe mental health issues uh, because of the occupation. So... Um, Another thing that I think is worth mentioning here is that uh, that the study does well is to show that the mental health issues that have uh, the that have appeared uh, in the Gaza Strip are not an apolitical issue. They're very much political. So uh, when we talk about mental health in Gaza, we are talking about the political context uh, of suffering uh, of trauma that has been present for years, for decades, uh, and essentially. Uh, this this shows that there has to be a shift of perspective when we talk about health in uh, Palestine and uh, when we talk uh, on the global level about what can be done. So, um, you know, going uh, going uh, going beyond that, what the research also does um, is essentially expose uh, the extent of uh, the human rights violations that we have seen from the Israeli occupying forces. Uh, also when it comes to the intensity and uh, to the frequency, because what many of the people who have participated in the study have, uh, have said and have repeated is that essentially the frequency of the attacks, the facts, uh, the fact that you, uh, you cannot uh, feel secure at any time uh, is one of the major stressors and it's one of the major causes of uh, of uh, of ill mental health among Palestinians, so uh, you know it's uh, the report does a good attempt to go uh, beyond just showing what the problem is, but it also uh, underlines the importance of taking political action on all levels to essentially change the situation that we are seeing uh, in the Gaza Strip right now. Right, and and maybe through uh, uh, through the lens of some of these uh, personal testimonies given by those who participated in the study, you can outline for us uh, some of the consequences, actually, of Israeli continued Israeli uh, military presence and action in the Gaza Strip. Starting from the basics, uh, the findings of the study uh, are based on research, which included both surveys, but also interviews uh, with women living in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the population is very important to highlight because it's... Uh, it's all women between 24, 25 years of age and 45 years of age, so very young women. Um, more than half of the, four, of the 400 or so uh, women who have taken part in the research are living in the refugee camps. 
uh, and what's uh, you know uh, also very important to highlight is that over 90% of them are unemployed or uh, or and are living uh, below the poverty line and so uh, when when we look a bit at the concrete mental health issues that the women highlighted uh, when talking to the researchers um, you know, of course, uh, very unsurprisingly, the first uh, the first thing they spoke about was fear, and so fear that takes very different forms. Uh, it's either fear of that, uh, but it's also fear of the future bombings or attacks on the Gaza Strip. So um, other women talked about the constant fear uh, that they felt when they thought about losing. Uh, the people they love, uh, losing family members, losing friends uh, because of Israeli aggressions that uh, that continue all the time and which leave them in a constant state of anxiety, actually. And then the second part that uh, I think we can uh, we can just talk briefly about um, is that because of the this very traumatic ex experiences that the women are exposed to, um, many of them lose any hope uh, it can be you know they lose hope in any hope when it comes to secure life uh, when it comes to stability but uh, it's also hopelessness about how things will change uh, and uh, if any stability will be achieved in Gaza uh, with time so uh, and this is something that's also a direct uh, consequence of the aggression and of the occupation uh, which essentially targets targets people this way uh, and uh, which hopes to cause uh, this kind of hopelessness uh, in order to break the the spirit of the Palestinian population. Um, but as we have seen before, you know, while people are feeling hopeless and while uh, these kind of traumas are being experienced in this way, uh, we also bear witness to the fact that uh, women in Palestine, along with uh, many other comrades in Palestine, uh, are not giving up on the fight. So uh, it's essentially, essentially, while the mental health is being impacted, um, we cannot really uh, talk about uh, the Israeli uh, aim being fulfilled. And then going beyond that, um, one other thing that the study makes a point uh, about is the issue of emotional blunting, which essentially means that uh, women have said that uh, they have become completely desensitized uh, to any kind of emotion. So essentially what they're saying is that they have seen so much devastation, so much destruction, uh, that they're essentially, they're feeling numb and that's it. So uh, this is also a very severe impact of the trauma uh, that the report uh, talks about. Uh, and it essentially shows how people are feeling uh, completely drained and detached from what is happening uh, and uh, essentially detached also uh, from everything that surrounds them. And then finally, of course, you know, just to, uh, to conclude this, um, what many of the women who have taken part in the study have said is that um, uh, as they live in a conflict zone, even when there's a temporary uh wind down of uh, uh, of while of violence uh they feel this con they are they find themselves in in this constant state of anticipation and of anxiety of what's going to happen next uh and essentially this brings to uh you know to situations where even harmless um uh, sounds or um uh, or, or, or other inputs such as fireworks uh they can trigger extreme anxiety attacks because they remind them of bombings and of uh, of the acts of violence that uh, they're witnessing every day. So, um, no, uh, and yeah, just one final point uh, that I think it's also quite well reflected in the report uh, is that essentially uh, it makes, um, it really wants to highlight uh, that when we are talking about the mental health of Palestinian women in the Gaza Strip, uh, it, we're not talking about something individual. So it's not an individual problem uh, when when women are reporting this kind of uh, this level of stress, of fear, of anxiety, of numbness. Uh, but it's essentially something that's the cause uh, of uh, the violence that takes place every day in Gaza, 
uh, and that essentially cannot be resolved uh, by, uh, let's call it normal means, by just policy intervention or increasing health services, but it's essentially a, po a political question. So the mental health of women uh, as well of men, as well of children in the Gaza Strip can only improve if the political context there, uh, uh, there changes. All right, thank you very much, Anna, for that update. We'll leave it there for today. And finally, six Australian lawmakers, including a former deputy prime minister by the name of Barnaby Joyce, are set to visit the United States of America. They're there to lobby for an end to the persecution of WikiLeaks founder and publisher Julian Assange, who's currently incarcerated in HMS Belmarsh, a high security prison in the United Kingdom. Assange faces extradition to the United States, where he will then be tried under the Espionage Act and faces a prison sentence of up to 175 years. The lawmakers formed a cross-party delegation, including Liberals, Greens, Labour, and even an independent representative. They are expected to meet members of the US House and Congress, as well as senior officials at the State and Justice Departments. Assange is, of course, an Australian citizen, and current Prime Minister Anthony Albanese has expressed frustration at not being able to find a diplomatic solution to his persecution by what is one of Australia's closest allies. Anish joins us now for more on the latest in the ongoing Julian Assange saga. Uh, Anish, good to have you back on the show. We've, of course, spoken about Julian Assange and his persecution often uh, on Daily Debrief and elsewhere on People's Dispatch. What is the latest with this round of visits, uh, specifically to lobby, I guess, the US government and US lawmakers and seek some support against the move to extradite him to the United States? Uh, what are the sort of reactions we're getting, uh, the response from within the United States? And of course, uh, then we'll talk about what's happening elsewhere in the world. Well, within the United States, uh, the response pretty much, at least from the official, the official response is pretty much muted. Uh, there's, there's pretty much no response, actually. They do not want to probably entertain uh, any kind of speculation, uh, but also do not want to entertain uh, the scheme that is coming the stream of lawmakers from Australia. Uh, what is interesting is that this is probably one of the most politically diverse uh, group that is going to be lobbying for uh, for Assange in the US right now. Uh, you, usually what we have seen so far is like there would be the WikiLeaks group and obviously uh, progressives and socialists and anti uh Very rarely do you see even the conservatives at the right wing within the Australian Parliament, uh, like uh, at least a section of them, actually uh, vouching for Assange primarily uh, based on the fact that he's an Australian citizen and he's entitled to uh, be returned home uh, and not uh, stand trial in the US court of law. And that is something that uh, would probably be their, uh, you know, their, the foundation of their argument at the point. But then there is also uh, there are also questions about uh, how or whether US has been restricted. Or uh, to uh, you know to uh, charge or convict, uh, sorry, uh, to charge or uh, you know uh, right. put to trial to uh, people or foreigners uh, on charges of espionage. That doesn't really matter uh, outside. Of, that shouldn't ideally matter to non-US citizens. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there will be like contours of the case that will be spoken about. And obviously, uh, there is very significantly, uh, these people will also be talking about uh, Assange's deteriorating health uh, within the prison, within the Belmarsh prison. And that is something that is uh, kind of new because obviously, what we have seen in previous uh, Scott Morrison uh, government, which was a conservative right wing government, alliance government, uh, they usually shied away from even acknowledging that Assange is uh, you know, virtually isolated from the world. And mm -hmm. the fact that his health has been, uh, you know, deteriorating to a great extent, including during the COVID pandemic, uh, when his block was actually one of the most infected in the prison system. And so this, uh, uh, this is definitely a welcome change. And it clearly shows that the Australian political uh, elites are kind of waking up to a very popular demand. There is a, there is definitely a massive movement uh, on the ground that is actually calling for uh, Assange's return. Uh, not just because he's uh, he is an Australian citizen, but also for the fact that he is somebody who exposed war crimes and the fact that he actually exposed the empire for some of the worst atrocities uh, that yeah. 
that man we have seen in the century. Oh. Yeah, uh, and and in in that sense, uh, Anish, this case, not that we are short on examples, but becomes another sort of shining light of uh, U.S. exceptionalism. Uh, you know, where you on the one hand talk about how other nations are sort of stamping on the rights of uh, journalists and on press freedoms. But on the other hand, this uh, is a persecution that's continued for easily over a decade. Uh, what are the kind of responses we're seeing from other parts of the world uh, as, as a result of all of this growing, like you said, movement to secure Assange's release? Well, uh, some of the more interesting moments that we, uh, sorry, responses that we're seeing uh, around the world uh, would be a one. Uh, the fact that the Western uh, establishment is not necessarily united on this matter uh, throughout the way. Like we have seen significant sections within the European uh, and different European governments and even the European Union, uh, play, uh, you know, bringing up the fact that Assange is a victim of uh, repression of the press and also his, if he's convicted or even expedited, it is going to have an impact on uh, press freedoms across the world and not just the US or the United Kingdom. And uh, the same thing we see, but we do not see that kind of diversity, obviously, in the US establishment. A lot of them are quite uh, uh, silent about it. The Biden of silence around this issue, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, there is a very calculated silence in, in a manner that, uh, like, obviously, some of them, you have had some of the, the so called progressives, uh, you know, watching for Assange in the past. But once Biden administration came in, and the fact that the the uh, the indictment was continued under them, mm. and the extradition uh, request was continued under them, there has been a significant level of silence that is quite uh, you know that is quite conspicuous, and it makes it uh, it clearly shows that that like as long as there's a liberal face to the empire, there is definitely not going to be much resistance within the empire. And nevertheless, uh, you've seen in different parts of the West, like especially in several U.S. allies, uh, having brought out the fact that, or you know, sections within the U.S. allies, uh, and I'm talking about people in the government, people in parliaments, uh, lawmakers, political leaders, talking about, uh, uh, you know, even including former heads of state, heads of governments, talking about Assange and calling for his release. And this is something that has also resonated around the world. For instance, China has definitely called out the U.S. for its hypocrisy, as you pointed out, on the fact that, like, it uh, often uses, a, uh, you know, uses any kind of, uh, you know, arrest that happens in China as an attack on press, free press or press freedoms uh, or, you know, the right to express, uh, free expression or whatever. Mm -hmm. But uh, when it comes to Assange, there is just absolutely no statement and all the talk is about, and the U.S. tries to justify it as, you know, the, uh, a very natural process of the law, uh, that the law is taking its uh, own course and it should, uh, it should should be allowed to when the fact is that it was a very clearly political uh, indictment mm -hmm. that has been, yeah, not politically motivated, it was a very clearly politically political indictment yeah, because yeah. it was, uh, you know, raised by somebody who was a political appointee himself. So under the Trump administration. So that uh, clearly shows that, you know, around the world, Assam pretty much has become the symbol of, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, how empire, uh, empire's reaches goes out of its uh, own uh, sovereign territory. It, it is actually trying to, it has uh, essentially put uh, somebody uh, uh, in a different country, a foreign yeah. citizen in a different country under arrest, under confinement for more than, you know, nearly 12 years now. And mm. in this time span, it has actually vilified significantly this one person and his entire, you know, body of work in different manners and forms. And you've seen different people in the government, uh, from the Obama administration to the Biden administration currently actually vilifying them. So his, uh, his stand, the fact that this case is happening, that the fact that there is an extension booming is definitely raised alarms across the world. And even, you know, the, uh, the mainstream media in the U.S. is kind of worried at this point. We have mm. to remember that, and that is pretty much the situation that we are looking at, where even with the, you know significant major pillars of the uh, of the West are actually quite worried about this expression, but there is nothing being done on that matter uh, on a substantial manner uh, within the U.S. at the very least.
All right, Anish. Uh, we leave it there. Thanks very much for that update on uh, the situation around Julian Assange and his continued persecution. That's a wrap for this episode of Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Don't also forget to give us a follow on the social media platform of your choice if you haven't already. We'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, thank you for watching. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you.